Now, what's been the response uh, from academia to this idea? Now, you have to say it's been pretty sparse. Uh, there's not been much uh, uh, about it at all published. Uh, I would like to know how many postgraduate students have been encouraged in the various universities around the world to study this idea. I have a hunch that the answer is actually zero. But there is a surprisingly high amount, about 40 pieces as far as I can gather, uh, pieces of literature which are at least open or actively supportive of the aquatic ape hypothesis in the scientific literature. And this is not including any of the proponents. I'm not talking here about Hardy or Morgan or Verhagen or anyone like that. Here we're just talking about people who would be considered neutral uh, and yet are, have at some point commented on or made some sort of a reference to the aquatic ape hypothesis. So the majority, surprisingly, is actually quite positive. So that begs the question, well, if you were to talk to an anthropologist today, there'd be no doubt that he or she would tell you that the hypothesis has been rejected by science, and, and they're very keen to stress that. Well, we don't reject things by gossip. We don't reject things by saying somebody's gone mad. In science, we reject things through the literature. So it begs the question, well, what is the literature that has rejected this hypothesis? And basically, there are three pieces of literature that, that, which do this. The first one, Lowenstein and Zillman, is a really uh, tiny little paper in an obscure journal called Oceans, and it, it really is a straw man argument. I mean, they make the point that if our ancestors had been aquatic, we would have flipper-like limbs, reduced limb size, like seals. I mean, that's, that's crazy. I mean, no one has ever suggested that our ancestors were ever that aquatic. So it's a straw man argument. The next paper, which is probably the most respected one, is the one by John Langdon, which was published in the Journal of Human Evolution in 1997. Now, I have to say that I think this paper is also a straw man argument. It, it basically parades and lists 26 uh, of these differences that I was talking about earlier that Elaine Morgan mentioned uh, in one of her books. And rather than give them the sort of weighting that she gives them and that I have just given, you know, I've just picked four or five of them out and said, look, these are really important. What he's done is listed all 26, including some that are very speculative and kind of a bit strange, and given them equal weighting and then dismissed them in a couple of sentences. I mean, for instance, the idea that wading through shallow water might have been a factor in bipedal origins is dismissed in two sentences. I mean, that's a huge su subject. I've done a lit review on bipedal origins and it took 150 pages to write it all out. And Long Langdon dismisses the whole thing in a couple of sentences. It's very superficial. A, a very Another bad thing about Langdon's paper is that he um, puts this idea, this so-called aquatic ape hypothesis, under the same umbrella as ideas like creationism and von Daniken's aliens from space. So are we to take from that then that John Langdon sees, uh, you know, cannot discriminate in terms of plausibility the likelihood that our ancestors went sh wading and, and swimming and diving through the shallows on the coast for a few hours a day and aliens coming down from outer space to inseminate a group of apes to, make, to start humanity. I mean, I think it's ludicrous that people can can think uh, can, can can can't sort of discriminate between these the, the plausibility of these two ideas. But I think perhaps the worst uh, indictment against Langdon's paper is it's not very scholarly. Uh, I, I mean, uh, the, the, there was just six years before Langdon's paper uh, a conference which specifically looked at the so-called aquatic ape hypothesis uh, Valken, in Valkenburg in Holland, and the proceedings were reported in a book called Road et al. Now, Langdon knew about that book, he did actually cite it, but he didn't draw upon its findings at all. He didn't actually use any of the quotes from that book or report of any of the studies. Now, if, if anybody else had submitted a, a, a paper for publication in the Journal of Human Evolution and did not draw upon s the most significant study that's ever been done or a symposium that had been done just a few years before, it would certainly have been rejected. But Langdon's paper apparently sailed through peer review without any difficulties. So what about this Road et al? Now, this book remains today uh, the most balanced, um, sort of even-handed uh, 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 book about the aquatic ape uh, that's, that's ever been published. Uh, the only problem with it is it's a bit polarised. You've got 11 proponents and 11 opponents all kind of battling it out. Uh, the, the, the symposium was held over several days in Holland. 
and then this book basically was the, the, the proceedings of that conference. And, you know, it's a bit, it was a bit like a football match, like a grand final, 11 a side match uh, between these two sides. And I have to admit um, that uh, in terms of the overall um, um, sort of conclusions that were done by the editors, that the Aquaticate was in fact rejected uh, on, based on, on, the, on the symposium. But to use a football analogy, and I am a bit of a football fan, I have to admit, um, it was no thrashing. This was not a thrashing. This is, uh, you know, was more like a, a match that was very even, um, and uh, right at the last minute, a fluky goal in injury time, after a dodgy refereeing decision, gave the uh, the, the, the team a one 0 win. And the reason I say that is, if you look at Vernon Reynolds, who was the chief editor, if you look at his comments, and you know, look at his concluding comments in that book, you'll see what I mean. Basically, he says, overall, it will be clear that I do not think it would be correct to designate our early hominid ancestors as aquatic. Now, who did? I certainly didn't. I don't know anybody who thought that our ancestors were aquatic in the sense that a seal is aquatic or a polar bear is aquatic or even an otter is aquatic. I've always taken it to being that it's just that of the apes, which are generally known for not being aquatic, we were the most aquatic. That's what I understood the aquatic ape to mean. Not that we were in any sense arguing that we were actually aquatic in the past. And in fact, uh, Vernon Reynolds actually then goes on to say, but he does think that the water uh, was a habitat which provided enough selection for uh, uh, enough extra food to count for an agency of selection. So he's basically endorsing, in my view, what I've always thought the aquatic ape theory to be. that that just basically moving through water provided some selection. So compared to the chimps, our ancestors moved through water enough to have some selection uh, and uh, have an effect on our phenotype compared to the apes. That's all I've ever thought the aquatic ape theory was. And here, Vernon Reynolds is basically rejecting a, an extreme view that no one holds and endorsing the view that I and a lot of people I know hold uh, as, as what this idea actually is. I think it's clear <clears throat> that this idea has been mislabeled um, and as a consequence misunderstood and misrepresented. It's mislabeled. It's not the aquatic ape. Aquatic, no, it's not aquatic. We're not talking about aquatic. We're talking about some selection from waterside habitats. Human beings are 100% terrestrial today to the nearest integer and there's no doubt about that. Uh, I would be the first to admit it. But I would argue that more people today probably spend more time swimming than they do climbing trees and yet nobody would have a problem arguing that we had a more arboreal ancestry. Now I think we need to redefine this idea and I'm using the words of uh, Vernon Reynolds in this definition. So I say waterside hypotheses, plural, of human evolution assert that wading, swimming and diving for food have acted as an agency of selection in the evolution of human beings more than it has in the evolution of our ape cousins. I think that is a better definition. Now, I think the, the, the main point about this that everybody seems to have missed is the, a, a point from population genetics. And that is, even tiny little amounts of selection will make a huge, profound difference to phenotypes and in relatively short evolutionary timescales. 20, 30,000 years might sound a long time to you and me, but in evolutionary scales, is nothing. Now, I wrote a little uh, sort of evolution simulator, a little uh, very simple thing in Access uh, with VB programming, uh, which you know I, I played around with, you know how much selection was required to make a, uh, an allele become fixed in the population. So you know I could vary the population size, how many individuals drowned per year, and how much advantage a particular allele would give you if. Uh, the, um, if, if you had it, you know, in terms of risk of drowning. And I played around with the figures and I found that, you know, usually, not every time, but usually, uh, with a population of a thousand, even if you assume that just one individual drowns per year and the allele gave you just a 1% advantage compared to those that didn't have the allele in terms of risk of drowning, then even that would be enough 
for that allele to become fixed within the population within 20, 30,000 years. Now, uh, I, I presented this to, the, to my department at UWA and the professor of uh, genetics, Link Schmidt, uh, basically said, well, there's nothing controversial about that. Uh, you know, anyone in, in population genetics knows that tiny amounts of selection will make a profound difference. And when we talk about human evolution, we talk about Allen's rule, this idea that people that live in hot climates have longer limbs, people that live in short climates have, uh, cold climates have shorter limbs, and, you know, the, the, the effects of climate are well known to have a difference in the phenotype. It seems to me that, well, if people accept things like that, then surely, you know, if we lived on the coast and went swimming a little bit, not, not, not becoming mermaids in any sense, it's bound to have a huge... Uh, effect on the phenotype. Why not? What, what's, what's people's problem with this idea?